So thank you all for being here. Um, I will try to stick to 10 minutes so we can have some time or be in time for lunch as well and have some discussion before we go. Um, I'll quickly start by introducing the research focus of our paper, um, followed by the system dynamics model that we've created, the simulation results that we obtained from the model, and the conclusions that we draw based of these results. Um, <clears throat> so to give a bit of a context for the research that we did, it's on the uh, Swiss energy system, which is a bit of a peculiar system because they have around 36% uh, nuclear energy and almost 60% hydro energy. And they have some renewables, it's only a few percent, and some uh, fossil energy production as well. Um, after the uh, accident in Fukushima, the decision was made to phase out uh, nuclear energy, um, also following the decision of Germany, although a bit less aggressive. So until two th 2035, uh, the nuclear energy will be gradually phased out. And ideally, it will be replaced by new renewables such as solar, wind, uh, geothermal, and biogas. Um, but there are some issues. The, the first is that um, there is actually not a lot of renewable energy at this point. So growth, um, even if the numbers are high, we, we start from a really small amount. Uh, the second point is that um, the federal government is has a very stringent CO2 policy, which means that if we build a new natural gas fired power plant, all the CO2 have to, have, will have to be offset. This makes it very expensive to build any type of natural gas power plant. And the last po point is that if we want to consider imports, uh, we're dealing with a lot of congestion in uh, physical congestion in the transmission lines for electricity. So now we have a clear trade off between cost, security of supply, and emissions. So if we want to produce everything within the country, it means that we're going to have to pay a lot of subsidies or we'll have to invest in transmission lanes, which might in the end not be used, or we're going to have to deal with the emissions that we have from natural gas. So the research question is, what is the impact of Swiss transition policies on its energy mix, energy price, and carbon emissions during the nuclear phase out? So we're not only interested in the final state of the system, but also what happens in between and possibly what happens after the phase out. <clears throat> so we use the system dynamics, which is a top-down modeling paradigm, which means that we predefine the structures, both technically and socially, and that the behavior of the system um, fundamentally is determined by these structures. And uh, what's important here is that it focuses on feedback loops within the system. So if we have multiple subsystems, we can see that if something changes here, how does it influence somewhere else in the system? And we can, I will show later some of these feedback loops. Um, then we use software Ventsim to support policy uh, evaluation, which means that we can run multiple policy scenarios and see what it means for the energy mix. Um, and it's also very modular. This means that right now we have a, a system with five subsystems, but we can easily add or subtract multiple subsystems as we want to expand the model or use it for a different country. So this is a very simplified picture of the conceptual model that we have created. Um, in the top left, there's the solar uh, subsystem. In the top right, we have the wind uh, subsystem. In the bottom left, we have natural gas. In the bottom right, we have import. And everything is linked through the energy market. And we can see a lot of the feedback loops, for example, the PV installed capacity to the retail electricity price, which means that if we have more uh, solar, pa uh, solar panels, due to the subsidies, the uh, retail price uh, will go up. And this is also what happened in Germany, is that it becomes more attractive for the households to build solar panels, which again increases the price. And like this, we have identified many more uh, feedback loops in, in the system. So the scenarios that we looked at is what happens if we continue doing business as usual, uh, which is basically a continuation of the 2010 policy, um, which focuses a little bit on energy efficiency and not so much on, on renewables. Um, but after the decision to phase out nuclear energy, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy also uh, devised the strategy to, to have a bit more ambitious policy, which means that there's a stronger focus on energy efficiency and renewables in the country. And as the third one, um, there's uh, an even more ambitious policy, I would say, where there's even more focus on energy efficiency, but still uh, a focus remains on renewable energy as well. 
And we look at the period between 2015 and 2050, uh, but maybe this is not enough. I'll get back to this in, in a minute. Um, so basically what happens uh, when we run the, the scenario is that we, we see that uh, the red line is the one for demand, which is slowly increasing. In orange, we see uh, nuclear energy, which is being phased out until 2035. And we see that most of the nuclear energy is actually replaced by natural gas in gray. <laughs> and the reason for this is that um, the renewables are not able to grow quickly enough to replace the nuclear energy once it's phased out. And the other point is that even if we wanted to import more energy, due to the congestion, we're not able to put more electricity through the, the, the lanes, especially in the border between Germany and France, it's very congested. <clears throat> so but what happens because of that is that um, we see primarily this, this replacement of nuclear by natural gas. And this is a technology that we'll be stuck with for quite a while. Because when you build a power plant like this, it means that you have it for around 30 years. So it's kind of, we're, we're going from being locked in, in a sense, to nuclear energy. We decide to phase it out just to be locked into to natural gas. <clears throat> so then we, we ran the, the scenario on, OK, so what, what happens if we have this increase in demand, but we introduce uh, renewable energy as well, or more renewables? Is that we see that there is less reliance on natural gas just for comparison. Um, this is because the, the growth is bigger in the start, but it's not enough to, to replace all the nuclear energy. And also we see that even if we introduce more renewables, the price doesn't increase that much in the end. Um, so what, what's interesting is that actually increasing the energy efficiency, so in a more ambitious energy um, policy scenario, is that it further decreases the reliance on natural gas. And this is because, you know, once we, now we have two trends at the same time, which is a decrease in electricity demand and an increase in renewables, which is able to fill in a larger gap of the production deficit. <clears throat> but if we see that we focus on an even more aggressive um, energy efficiency policy, it doesn't matter too much for the investments in natural gas. And this is because the lock-in into natural gas happens earlier, while the, the gains that we can get from energy efficiency, as we can see here, is more after the period that we've already phased out uh, nuclear energy. Mm. So to get back to the research question, um, as we can see, it cannot be compensated by natural gas and imports alone. So here, uh, I want to emphasize that we only looked at what happens if we phase out nuclear energy and see if we can replace it by natural gas or renewables. Another option would be to invest in uh, transmission capacity and to consider energy imports as a replacement for natural gas as well. Uh, but you would run into a similar issue here is that these transmission lines have a lifetime of 50 years. And maybe, um, as you can see here, uh, maybe at the end of the simulation period, the, um, the natural gas fired power plants reach their end of life. So we will have enough renewables to replace the natural gas that will be removed from the system. Um, and we would be stuck with the transmission lanes. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so basically like I stipulated before, so we're going from a reliance on nuclear to a reliance on natural gas, which is lasting for decades. Um, but I would like to tease the idea that natural gas can be a transition fuel, uh, which is something they don't like to hear in Switzerland because they're kind of allergic to, to natural gas. They have a very low carbon uh, emission system. Um, but I think it's a realistic option, or we have to invest in the transmission uh, capacity. So even though the energy efficiency and renewable energy um, stimulation will increase the energy price, it is something needed for, for the future once we get rid of either electricity imports or uh, natural gas. Uh, the future research will focus more on adding different subsystems. Right now, we did not consider biogas or geothermal. Uh, we did not look too, too much into how is demand being shaped by uh, what is going on in the different subsystems. And um, I, I mentioned um, uh, uncertainty 
or I didn't mention uncertainty, but it's a very important thing that if you want to look 35 years into the future, of course, we have a lot of uncertainty. And through the uh, simulation software that we've used, we can identify the parameters which are uncertain, and we can run a Monte Carlo simulation to, to really see what is the range of options that we have into the future to be able to better explore um, the range of possibilities. And this will help in, in future policy making because I, I think it's not so much about predicting will we have 30% of this energy source or will it be 31%. It's much more about what is the trend and what is the range of possibilities that we see in the future. I don't know if it was 10 minutes, but thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. I'm Surya, and I'm here with my uh, manager, Professor Abu Bakr Bahaj. We are both from University of Southampton. And today we're talking about the integration of renewable energy power into the UK electricity infrastructure. Um, first, we're going to talk about the motivation of this work, then research questions about uh, interdependency of infrastructure system, and then we go into our modeling framework, and we're going to make a case for, uh, for this framework. So the British IO, including Scotland, are blessed with about 40% of wind energy uh, potential in Europe. But there are some cupids. First is the viability of wind. Secondly, the diurnal uh, characteristic of wind, the wind speed during the day and the night, they differ significantly and also more in the summer. And thirdly, the amount of flow of power tend to go from north to south. And we have more uh, load in the south than more renewable development in the north then imagine that um, the existing infrastructure already uh, stressed by the current flow with the increase in new renewable energy development, then uh, more um, improvement are unavoidable. So in the bigger picture, the UK energy system is being shaped by two forces. One is the Climate Energy Act, and the other one is the EU mandatory, uh, which needs to have a certain uh, fraction of energy from renewable. So, and as in many countries, the electricity sector contributes about a quarter to a third of the carbon uh, emission. So the sector is, seem like the, the easier uh, sector to decarbonize. And in the next uh, few years, and up until 2020, the UK will spend largely uh, about 100 billion pounds in new infrastructure in the energy sector alone. So there's an urgent need to reinforce both the existing and the new infrastructure on both the generation and the transmission. This work is a part of ICIF, which is the International Center for Infrastructure Futures. And the idea is we have to think about interdependency, how we can integrate this thinking into the question we already faced, how are we gonna select the competing technologies to decarbonize the whole sector, and how would you optimize it? As a single system, as a system or system with the interdependency in the picture. So we're focusing on the cost of renewable energy integration into UK power system, how costs are shared and, and can be improved that may benefit other infrastructure as well. And we need to understand interdependency to be able to model. And with the hope that with thinking in interdependency, we may be able to review some new uh, business models or policy instrument. Uh, I just uh, made this figure 
based on this work uh, referencing. Um, basically, renewable energy integration costs are governed by uh, higher power, which is the force of the uncertainty, the location specificity, and variability. Each affect the balancing cost, the grid related cost, and then the profile cost. They are interrelated. And how much and in which direction they are related are subject to further research. But that's the idea of integration cost. So using the linear programming approach, it's a cost minimizing uh, linear program. So we try to combine the short-term operation characteristics and the long-term investment planning in, into one framework. And we have uh, several uh, input parameters like demand, and existing uh, capacity, and transmission. And then the field cost, the other cost factor like generation, transmission, uh, the, the loss factor, and then the generation profile for renewable power. So those as input enter into the modeling. Then what we get is how much you want to invest in the new technologies, also in transmission, and the use of existing and the new generating capacity, and then the uh, power transfer between the boundaries. So this is uh, a picture of the model. Uh, we don't need to go into that, but that is just to minimize the expected total cost from different uh, source of cost, the integration cost from like the CAP, CAP, which is the investment in new capacity of different technologies in different uh, boundaries. And you discount back uh, by the years that you, that you analyze. Then you have uh, the generation in energy term, and then the NTC is the net transfer capacity. Uh, the amount of power you can transfer between system boundaries. And we have the concern like the power capacity, we have the demand, we have to meet the demand during the uh, in energy term and during the, uh, the peak time. And then we have the renewable constraint that, and there are other concerns related to transmission and uh, carbon emission. So similar framework has been employed uh, for the, the European wide problem when they look at the nodes of uh, cities or um, major substation in European countries, including the UK. And they come up with you know, plans like how we're gonna upgrade the transmission uh, network based on different scenarios. So in most uh, work using this kind of view, they would come up with two different models. One is to do the market model, which is a uh, linear optimization, like what I proposed. And the other one is to use a simulation model of the power flow. So it's combined of economics and then electrical engineering power flow. In, in, in some work, it, it, use, uh, it takes a whole consulting company to do um, the simulation work of the power flow. This um, model, uh, our, our approach is to combine the two and do some manual work, but we do the linear optimization and adjust uh, the capacity as we go until we reach a satisfactory result. So making a case uh, for the UK, so this is the map of the UK, the, the transmission lines, the area that we're focusing on, and the boundaries. So this is an approach that we, we aim to, to apply to the UK. Uh, to combine the two ideas together with uh, compact modeling to, uh, to help with efficient implementation. And how we do that is, uh, is in, a, uh, in a more detail. Like we don't go into the hourly load, like 8,700 uh, um, hour per year. We go into a chunk or section using the representative days of the season so that we reduce the amount of uh, computation. And we consider both the generation and uh, transmission into this model. That's all I have. Thank you, Chair. So
So uh, we are here in America, but our presentation is for Europe. We discuss about uh, energy, renewable energy. Now we'll discuss about hydrogen. In fact, hydrogen will be like a key which will solve uh, many, many problems from, uh, uh, from energy infrastructure. My na the name of presentation is Hydrogen Economy Opportunities in Romania. Uh, my name is Ioan Iordache, but also I have other two colleagues which was implied in this presentation and in fact in all my work. Ioan Ștefănescu from uh, Romania and Adrian Gheorghe. He is a professor at Old Domino University here in the United States. First, to have one idea where is loca located my, uh, my uh, research institute. There is a map of Europe, map of uh, Romania, and uh, you can find uh, this uh, red uh, spot in the more or less center of Romania. There is a city of Rumniku Vulcea, where is a national center for hydrogen and fuel cell. I'm a researcher in this institution, and also I put on your table one brochure about Romanian um, Association for Hydrogen Energy. Please take it. Also, I'm an executive director of this association. Of course, like any uh, this similar organization, this organization want to promote also hydrogen, also Romanian uh, actor in this area. The result or uh, which I used in this presentation and the uh, part of the uh, work from this presentation was possible because uh, uh, me and my colleagues was present in High Under project, was an European project, two years uh, European project, uh, start in uh, 2012 and finished last year. This project was a project in order to, to, to create like a map of Europe in order to understand the potential actors relevant business case, geological structure for hydrogen underground storage in the salt cavern. Here was 12 partners from seven country. You can find at the bottom of the slide the logo of each company. You can find Shell, can find also Solvay or Commissariat de Energie Atomique, uh, the, the, the Commission for uh, Atomic Energy in France. Also some um, German company, Hinicio is a consulting company for European Union and so on. Some Romanian facts, but it's not only in Romania, in fact, it's general fact for, uh, for, for all country. In our days, a lot of uh, 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 central administration and local administration made a, a real huge effort in order to improve some mix of energy in fact, in order to increase the part of renewable energy. This renewable energy have a problem. They are free, but one, the investment is very huge. Second, they are not all time, are intermittent. It's a fluctuation from day to day or from season to season. The wind can be during the winter, but maybe in the summer is not so strong. The sun is only in the middle of the day, but also depend by weather. And that need um, to improve our capacity to storage energy or electricity itself is not possible to be storage. We can storage electricity indirectly in a chemical system like a battery or like a hydrogen or hydro pumping and so on. And hydrogen is one solution in order to store it, uh, electricity from renewables, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a key. And if you produce, okay, you have, but it's need, we discuss about huge quantity of hydrogen, and for that is need to storage. Where can it, is possible to storage it? One solution is to store hydrogen in um, salt caverns, from geological point of view is one good solution. And for example, in Romania, we have a long tradition of salt extraction. We have a potential for um, salt caverns. And um, hydrogen undergone storage can become a potential attractive solution and can be a business in the future. Also, other uh, specific uh, fact is that our participation in this uh, European project was a positive example for Romania. Also for me and for my team, 
in Romania in order to show to the other colleagues that we are able to be part in the serious program and international projects, and also for you and for the other ones which can found that Romanian actor in this field of hydrogen and fuel cell are smaller, but they can play an important role and can be focused on um, very attractive solution and to storage hydrogen and to produce hydrogen from renewable in order to reuse again is one solution to solve this problem with fluctuating um, renewable energy. Till now I discuss and I, we, I start with uh, hydrogen underground storage. Of course, if we uh, are able to storage hydrogen is okay, but the story alone is not a solution. It's like for a car to have only engine or only wheels. No, it's not car. If you want to have a car, you need to have all elements. The hydrogen underground storage is only one element, in fact, in one huge infrastructure. Infrastructure would imply pipelines, like for gas, also transmission rings, because it needs to have a robust, massive system, but also it needs to be flexible. And this kind of transmission ring or more rings, depends, is a solution. And usually is you use it, this um, system in electricity, excepting large facility for uh, hydrogen underground storage also is need to have a smaller unit for hydrogen storage. Connection is very important. To connect the system, the hydrogen infrastructure with electricity infrastructure, maybe with a gas infrastructure, maybe with industry, and also one premium market in hydrogen economy is mobility. We can use, and here in America, in California, or in Europe, in Germany, and in Norway, there are some captive floats with hydrogen fuel cell car. That is electrical car, which use hydrogen fuel cells and is no polluting cars. So we need to have an interconnection between hydrogen system with transport system. Also, is need to have an interconnection with European uh, networks. And here we can discuss about two kinds of market. Energy market, where we can discuss about hydrogen, like a vector or carrying for energy market, and also about um, storage market. At European level, is a lot of discussion if this storage is possible to be only for a country or to be an interconnection. Because, for example, in Alps, they built a lot of hydro pumping system, but Sometimes it's some kilometer for uh, border to border, but there is not electrical connection between them. So it's need to have this infrastructure. And other, other important step is a nuclear hydrogen. If uh, renewable energy is fluctuating and is not constant, it's the same problem with the people which use electricity, with users. Users don't use constant electricity, but a nuclear power plant or only constant. If you'll have more electricity than is need, what to do with this electricity? It's not possible to switch on the nuclear power plant. So it's, when you have excess of energy, you can use this to produce hydrogen. And hydrogen is possible to be produced by nuclear uh, power plant in more direction. One to use a standard electrolysis of, of water, high temperature electrolysis of water, but also to use waste heat from nuclear power plant and to use to produce hydrogen from water, not using electricity, just using some chemical elements and thermochemical cycles in order to produce water and add, uh, to produce sorry, hydrogen. And at the end of the, these cycles, you will recycle the chemicals. Here is some perspective for hydrogen demand in Romania. You can found, find that the uh, hydrogen for transport application, for mobility, have a huge potential. In fact, is a minimum for 2025 and maximum for 2050. Of course, taking consideration also minimum and maximum possibility to, to ask for this hydrogen. Also, 
electricity market also is possible to send this hydrogen in uh, gas net natural gas network because to, to, to supply the import of gas. Also, there are some hydrogen from industry, but this uh, hydrogen is a captive one. So it's not so important as this fact. Here is uh, for four locations is found in Romania. We made uh, analysis, multi-criteria analysis using a method which is the scientific method in order to be able to compare this location. And you can find here some aspect, geologic, geographic, industrial, green, and so on, mobility. But this methodology can help you to integrate new aspects or to increase and to modify this aspect or to have in the in, to take in consideration new elements and here down uh, in the down part is a picture with this mine this is for touristical activity but of course we discuss about to storage hydrogen in a cavern not in a mine but the size uh, the, the location is similar because geology don't let you to to, to move uh, the potential of storage in the other directions here you is a a Romanian electricity network, you can find in the yellow the potential for wind farms, but in fact, the main quantity of wind energy is next to the Black Sea. And in fact, in Romania, now the uh, largest wind farm from Europe is in Romania, in Dobroja. If the electricity infrastructure is well distributed, the renewable is really in some corner of country, have a huge potential. You can find here the power installed in 2012-13 and uh, possible in 2012. But of course, because there is a lot of um, money in order to support this investment, the private participant made proposal for 25,000 of megawatt, more than is needed. But where is the money, the business will arise. about the Romanian potential for hydrogen underground storage and also the potential of uh, Romanian um, uh, uh, infrastructure of hydrogen economy. We, we made a lot of articles. Here is some example of this scientific uh, literature in journals. And the intention is to promote hydrogen, that hydrogen economy will be competitive in Romania. Of course, depends by some elements, but we can be partner in this kind of business. And for future, hydrogen will be a business. Final remarks. In Romania, we found four potential uh, locations for um, uh, hydrogen underground storage in a salt cavern. Here you have on this map also again in the blue color this uh, 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 location. This location in Romania is good because there is well distributed. It's not a, um, uh, it's not a, it's not a disproportion in Romania. So it's a good for infrastructure. And of course, hydrogen infrastructure means not only storage, also energy, backup system, supply system for electricity, but also mobility, which is a premium market. And don't forget that all this opportunity arise do the need to switch from one outdated infrastructure to new ones. Is is something logical, no? We change all, why don't change the infrastructure? It was time for one system, but now is the time for the new one. And hydrogen will be important and integrant part of future infrastructure of the future of infrastructures. Thank you and visit us in Romania. I have two questions. One for the nuclear, um, actually they're both nuclear related. Uh, the hydrogen from waste heat, do you have calculations uh, that would, that you can do some economics on the using waste heat from a nuclear power plant to produce hydrogen? And the second question uh, is for the Swiss, um, in the Swiss case, uh, what I, I had missed the earlier part of your presentation, so you may have said this, uh, is the uh, what is the policies regarding 
uh, nuclear power uh, in Switzerland? Is there a phase out or why in other parts of the world they're looking towards nuclear power for non-carbon generation? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So about uh, heat waste, in, in a nuclear power plant, the temperature of uh, steam is sometimes between 200 and uh, 600 degrees Celsius. But in the uh, first generation of uh, nuclear power plant, this uh, temperature will increase more till at some hundred, uh, till at 1,000 degree. So some people take in consideration to use this huge amount of heat. And one uh, situation, of course, is to use some uh, chemical reaction in order to split water in two, in hydrogen and oxygen, but after this, to regenerate this chemical, like electrolysis, but not with electricity, only with heat. And in fact, is a thermodynamic combination between chemistry and high temperature, because temperature can help you to favorite some reactions. Also, low temperature helps the other reaction. And here we discuss about sulfion cycles, about the copper chloride, but there is around 200 technical possible chemical reaction which combine this high temperature and uh, in order to split water in a uh, basic element, hydrogen and, hydro uh, and oxygen. That is idea. If we want to discuss more about chemistry of this reaction, can we discuss after because it's really but can I help you with information in concrete articles if you want? But that is the idea, to split water, but not with electricity, with heat. Thank you. Rainer? Yeah, so uh, for Switzerland, it was more a political decision to not rebuild nuclear. So it means that the nuclear power plants that are in place, they're operated until they're safe uh, end of life. And which translates to a phase out by 2035. Um, yeah, so yeah, other countries are looking at rebuilding, but for, for Switzerland, they, they've decided that it's an exit for, for nuclear in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a, uh, th uh, in the United States, nuclear power plants, or some of them, are undergoing life extensions. Mm -hmm. So when you had mentioned the license, the original license year, in the United States, that's been extended 20 years. The in the in the Swiss case, is that something that's? Um, they're trying very hard to to get this to happen, um, but it really depends. So they made an estimation, and well, as it stands, as you could see in, in the graph, I don't know if you've you've seen it. Um, they predicted by 2035, the last one will go out of commission. Uh, the ones who own and operate the plants, they would very much like this extension, of course, so they're trying very hard. Um, but as it stands, this is this is not the case for Switzerland. Yeah. Can Europe I? is a manner now to close uh, this nuclear reactor. In Italy was with more than 20 years ago, now in Germany and in New York country. Mm -hmm. uh, Romania and France is at opposite corner. They promote yeah. nuclear electricity, but we must accommodate. <laughs> yeah. The UK has also decided more recently to um, extend the, the nuclear power plants license and to build actually new ones. Um, mm, yeah. The problem that the UK is facing is the, the mm. uh, disposal of the nuclear waste, which they are still stockpiling. We still haven't got a permanent solution for our nuclear waste, so, which mm. is another, another issue that, of course, we are not covering today. Any further questions? Yes, please. Would you like to use the? I can speak. Uh, can you say who you? Where well, you are? One of the co-authors, in fact, of one of the papers. I'm not talking to my. Okay. In relation to the UK nuclear um, issue, um, because some of the funders for the nuclear plant in Hankley Point is China, there is now a withdrawal of China as a, a partner to finance the nuclear scheme. So it's a real big question for the UK. It may not go nuclear. Yeah. Also in Romania and China want to finance. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And and then and when the discussion was ongoing, there was a lot of questions about the the employment opportunities and so on because China was involved. 
but I don't want us to sidetrack to something we did not really discuss. Yes, please. So, uh, Rainier, in your presentation, uh, I think in, in the most uh, ambitious scenario, uh, there was a reduction in imports. Um, do you think that that will be a general trend or is it specific to uh, the Swiss case? And if so, it would lead to a less interconnected grid at the European scale. What implications would that have in terms of resilience? Yeah, so there's two parts to, to the question. The first one is that it's also this one, it's a political decision of the government to be energy self-sufficient, but it would prefer not to import electricity. Um, but at the same time, and what was not shown in the graph is that if you have more renewables between the countries, you will have a lot of transit, which is what's happening right now. I mean, in, in Germany, when they have negative energy prices, sorry, <clears throat> then a lot of the flow goes through Switzerland to Italy or, or France. Um, and once you have more it, intermittent um, sources in, in Europe, and not a lot of countries have stories except for Switzerland, you will see more cross-border flows. But this is not the type of uh, import and export that are contracted to um, maybe fill in a deficit, which is what, what's happening in, in Switzerland is that during winter, they can rely less on their hydro capacity because a lot of it comes from meltwater, uh, which, I mean, happens in after winter, of course. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And uh, I wanted to contrast the uh, British experiment in modeling and the Swiss one. Mm -hmm. So uh, your two problems are relatively similar, but you've opted for very distinct uh, modeling approaches. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about why one chose for uh, linear programming and the other for systems dynamics to guide the choice if we have to make such a choice? Okay. Um, system dynamics versus linear programming, there are just two that you can choose to use on your preference. And the problem context, yeah, they are similar, which is to select competing technology to uh, meet the future demand at the same time to decarbonize. And the reason we uh, at Southampton and ICIP use linear programming is because we want to be able to combine the two uh, modeling framework, trying to solve two problems in one. And uh, technically, linear programming is readily solved. There are um, many commercial solvers that can, can solve. But our task at hand is to model the problem to our context. So to me, the techniques, they are just tools. Um, but the problem, yeah, we have to choose the right technologies. Yeah. OK, thank you. I have one more question here. Are there any other questions just for me to manage the time left? Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Hadi from uh, Australian Maritime College, uh, University of Tasmania. My question is regarding the Switzerland case. Um, uh, by asking this question, I'm not ignoring the benefits of uh, renewable energy, but uh, when we look at your systems dynamic model, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you have considered the social impacts of uh, such decision on uh, people's life and community. I want to ask you, have you considered a negative impact of shifting from uh, energies so, such as uh, fossil energies to renewable energies as well? Because there are some negative impacts as well. Yeah, so two things that we looked at. The first one is the electricity price, which is the one that is most direct in a sense. I mean, when you invest in renewables, they are paid for by subsidies by the end consumer. Uh, the second thing is that uh, it was one of the feedback loops. Maybe I should have highlighted it because it's a pretty important one in Switzerland. It's the um, social acceptance. And for example, if you build a lot of windmills and people don't like if you build windmills on the pretty Alps and other places, uh, but once you build more of them, you're going to run out of space. And it's kind of, it's taking away the available land and the landscape. 
to the Swiss people. So we took this other social dimension to consideration, I would say, through the uh, social acceptance of wind and, and other renewables. Yeah. I also think from a transport management perspective, this shift will remove some jobs, uh, some freight activity, and uh, this should be considered as well. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm happy that you raised that question because I was also going to ask uh, Surya that have you built this? Because in the UK, the public acceptability of some of the larger wind farms has been a major, major issue, and everybody blames planning for it. But of course, it's not planning, it's the public opposition through the planning system which surface at that level. But I suppose you've built that into your generation time, probably, in your, in your model, right. am I right? Yes, yeah. including uh, dispatching yeah. some characteristics of the demand and then yeah. the renewable generation. Thank you, right, right. Is there any other final questions? If it's not, could you please join me to thank our very good speakers?